On June 12, 1993, a man is walking through Lloyd Park Reserve in Frankston, 40 kilometres east of Melbourne, Victoria. He sees something off about a section of the park following a night of heavy rain and thunderstorms. He takes a closer look and is horrified by what he discovers. The body of a female, covered by two tree branches. The victim's throat has been slashed and a crisscross pattern has been carved into her chest. The man runs to the nearest payphone and calls for police. The victim is 18-year-old Elizabeth Stevens, and she is the first murder victim of one of Melbourne's most deadliest serial killers. Join me tonight as we uncover Paul Denyer, the Australian transgender killer. Paul Charles Denyer is born in Sydney on April 14, 1972, the third of six children, five boys and a girl to English working class immigrants, Maureen and Anthony Denyer, who came to Australia in 1965 and eventually settled in Campbellton, near Sydney. The only significant thing about Paul Denyer's infancy was that as a baby, he rolled off a bench and knocked his head. This became a family joke for many years, and whenever he would say or do anything out of the ordinary, it would prompt the comment, that's because you fell on your head as a baby. Denya had trouble mixing with other kids at kindergarten, but seemed to grow out of this by the time he reached primary school and was just one of the normal kids. But that all changed when the family moved to Victoria in 1981 so that Anthony Denya could take up the position as manager of the steak place in Centre Road, South Oakley, on the Frankston train line. None of the children approved of the move. They were happy at Campbellton, and Paul especially found it extremely hard to make the adjustment. At his new school, North Our Primary, he was a completely different boy a loner who found it difficult to make friends and who lacked self-confidence and was totally unmotivated. To make matters worse, Paul Denyer grew into a big lump of a lad, much taller and a lot fatter than the other kids. And instead of playing with the usual things that would occupy a boy at his age, he grew up fascinated with his collection of knives and clubs and homemade slingshot guns that fired pebbles and ball bearings. His murderous intention started at an early age when he regularly dissected his sister's teddy bears with a homemade knife. And when he was 10, he stabbed the family kitten and hung it from a tree in the backyard. Later on, while working at what would be his last place of employment, he allegedly slaughtered and dismembered two goats in a paddock next door. Just before his 13th birthday, Paul Denyer was charged with stealing a car and was released with a warning. Two months later, he was in trouble again and charged with making a false report to the fire brigade, theft and willful damage. At age 15, Denya forced another boy to masturbate in front of some children and was charged with assault. In 1992, he enters into a relationship with Sharon Johnson, a girl he had met while working at Safeway Supermarket, a job that came to an end when he allegedly deliberately knocked down a woman and a child with a convoy of empty shopping trolleys. Denya then applies to join the Victorian police force but is rejected on the grounds that he's unfit due to his massive bulk. Denya's last place of employment is a marine workshop where he's ultimately fired because he spends more time making crude knives and daggers than doing his actual work. By 1993, Denya is a social outcast. He's unable to hold a job down through a mixture of laziness and incompetence. Now nicknamed John Candy after the rotund film star because of his bulk and physical appearance, Denya develops a fixation for death, the macabre, and horrific murder movies such as The Stepfather, which he watched repeatedly. On June 11, 1993, 18-year-old college student Elizabeth Stevens is reported missing to police by her uncle and aunt. Elizabeth is usually home at 8pm. As the hours pass, Elizabeth's uncle and auntie become concerned due to the bad weather outside. It's Friday night, so it's possible Elizabeth is out for some drinks with friends or is experiencing some car trouble. Elizabeth had recently moved from Tasmania to Melbourne to study, so the possibility that she is lost is also a likely contender. Fearing this, Elizabeth's uncle gets in his car and searches for her, following the route she would normally take from home to Frankston TAFE, the college Elizabeth attended, and to all surrounding areas such as supermarkets and fast food restaurants. However, he comes out empty-handed and decides to notify the police of Elizabeth's disappearance. Police are unable to search for Elizabeth in their full capacity due to the weather conditions, resulting in a long night of worry and frustration by those closest to her. The next morning, 
Elizabeth's body is found in Lloyd Park Reserve. A young woman with a strong head on her shoulders and dreams of joining the army has lost her life and her family robbed their daughter, niece and sister. This triggers a large investigation by police. However, no external forensic evidence is found at the scene and no witnesses come forward. About a month later, on Thursday, July 8th, 41-year-old Rosa Toth alights at Seaford Railway Station and heads north along Railway Parade on her way home. Around 5.50pm, as she walks past Seaford North Reserve, she notices a man loitering near the toilet block. She walks past him, but is attacked minutes later after she passes him. Toth is dragged into the park at gunpoint. She pretends to submit, but breaks free and manages to escape. Shaken and with light injuries, she runs back to the road, stops a car, and is assisted by the driver back to her house. However, the assailant doesn't end his night here. Minutes later, he stalks and abducts his next victim. 22-year-old Deborah Freem is at home at the time of the assault of Rosa Toth, entertaining a male family friend and caring for a newborn 12-day-old son while their boyfriend Gary is working the night shift. She decides to head to the petrol station to buy some milk for an omelette dinner. Freem leaves the newborn in the care of a friend and leaves her home at 7pm. She gets into a grey Nissan Pulsar and drives to the station four minutes up the road near Seaford Station, but never returns home. By 8pm, the male friend calls Freem's boyfriend to let him know Freem hasn't returned. He then calls police and the local hospital for news of her whereabouts and any possible accidents. Gary immediately returns home and with the newborn in the car, the men search frantically for hours for Freem. Eventually, Gary reports him missing at Frankston Police Station. The same night, Toth also reports the incident of her assault to Frankston Police and gives them a description of the man who assaulted her. This sets off red flags to police due to the locations of both incidents and time frame. Although it can't be determined if foul play is suspected with the disappearance of Deborah Freem, police start searching for the man as described by Rosa Toth. Police draw up a profile of the suspect. A male, blue eyes, 180 centimetres tall, likely employed or with a menial job, likely a local resident, aged between 18 and 24, average looking and living alone. Meanwhile, hopeful that his girlfriend will return home, Gary appeals to the community, appearing on televised events and appealing to newspapers to help find his newborn's mother and the love of his life. But on the afternoon of Monday, July 12th, a farmer finds Frame's partially covered body on Taylor's Road in Carrum Downs. Like Elizabeth Stevens, she's been strangled, savagely slashed, and her throat has been cut. A now 16-day-old newborn will never know his mother, as her life has been stolen. A second investigation is now underway. A search is organised, and scuba divers examine nearby Cannonock Creek. Like the Stevens scene, no foreign forensic evidence is found due to the poor weather conditions, but one witness will eventually come forward to recall seeing a car matching that that Freem owned, driving erratically and flashing its high beam lights. Local police locate the vehicle nearby Madden Street, with traces of Freem's blood inside the car. But police still don't have enough to identify the suspect, but link the three assaults together and issue a warning to the public, warning all women to take precautions. Despite heightened public fear, media speculation and warnings from a school, on Friday July 30th, 17-year-old schoolgirl Natalie Russell takes her usual shortcut from John Paul College through a fenced walkway which passes between two golf courses on Sky Road to head home, which is located in Frankston North. Russell is attacked by an unknown assailant and is dragged through a large hole in a wire fence into adjacent scrub. Russell's parents are greatly concerned when she doesn't make it home by 8pm and report her missing to police. Shortly after, police search the area and are quick to discover Natalie Russell's dead body. Like the victims before her, Russell had her throat cut and been slashed across the chest, but police note that she had put on a considerable fight, thus allowing investigators to collect DNA evidence not belonging to her. But as soon as police start their searches from the collected DNA, they receive the breakthrough they desperately need. A postal worker reports that on July 30, at 2.30pm, he recalls seeing a rusted yellow Toyota Corona without number plates parked near the walkway on Sky Road, with a man using binoculars acting suspiciously inside. As he stopped at a house to call police, he noticed Natalie Russell approaching the track alone, observed by the suspicious man, who then ran up the track. 
Police attended at the time, noting the registration label of the car, and door knocked a few nearby houses, but soon had to leave to attend another call before the suspect returned. That's when the inspectors realise that the murder of Natalie Russell may have happened while police were only metres away. Police look up the registration label number and identify its owner, Paul Charles Denyer, and on July 31st, pay him a visit at his home, located in Seaford. He shares the unit with his girlfriend. Upon questioning Denyer, he admits to being in the vicinity of the Freeman Russell murders at the time. Denyer is taken into custody and assists police with their investigation at Frankston Police Station. His video interview commences at 9.20pm, where he's unable to adequately explain the cuts and scratches the officers notice on his body. He also admits to being in the vicinity of the Stevens attack. Denyer agrees to have his DNA collected, and early on August 1st, suspecting that the police had his DNA evidence, Denyer admits to the murders, the Toth assault, and something police weren't expecting, the slasher break-ins. Back in February of the same year, Donna Van's Claude Street unit in Seaford is broken into. After a series of disturbing prank calls, Vane's was fearful of being alone. Arriving home with a boyfriend at around 1am, having been out for about an hour, they found their cat's throats had been slashed, as had the walls, furniture, and some of the baby's clothes. Female pornographic imagery was also found, and the message, Donna you're dead, written in blood on the wall. Unwilling to stay at the unit, she moved in with her sister, who was living in the unit next door to Paul Denyer, and whose neighbour had also recently been the victim of a break-in slasher. The case remained unsolved, but police were relieved that they could now close this case. Denyer also tells detectives that he's been stalking women in the Frankston area for years, and that the motivation of the crimes was a desire to kill from the age of 14, and a general hatred of girls and women. He also reports that he was raped by his brother as a child, which contributed to his mental state. Denyer is charged with three murder counts and one of abduction, charges to which he later pleads guilty and does not contest. Psychologists and experts examined Denyer, noting a lack of emotion regarding the crimes, a single-minded desire to kill, and the usual randomness by which victims were chosen, leading to a diagnosis of sadistic personality disorder, but not legal insanity. On December 20th, 1993, after four days of hearings, he is sentenced in Melbourne Supreme Court to three consecutive life sentences with no parole period. On December 31st, however, Daniel lodges an appeal, which was heard in July 1994, granting him a non-parole period of 30 years, or until 2023. In 2004, after 10 years in jail, Paul Daniel sexually identifies as female, and now goes by the name Paula. In a series of letters sent to a fellow inmate, Daniel has claimed that these feelings for gender dysphoria are what led her to seek revenge against women by murdering them. In letter 6, dated Wednesday, February 4th, 2004, she wrote, I committed these disgusting crimes, not because I ever hated womankind, but because I never really felt that I was a male. Around this time, Denya began wearing women's clothing and cosmetics in prison in defiance of prison orders. Denya also filed freedom of information requests to learn of the Victorian government's policy on gender reassignment surgery for prisoners and sought evaluation to determine her suitability for such surgery, which was also rejected by medical specialists and criticised by the transgender community. By summer 2004, Denya was receiving counselling on gender identity issues from prison psychologists. However, as at 2013, Denya had not taken the step of changing name legally. That brings us to the end of the episode. Now if you missed part one of this story, please see the link in the description below to watch that as well. If you want to see more content like this, consider subscribing to the channel and if you liked the video, give it a like and let me know what you thought in the comments below. The information in this video was done carefully with uh, as much research as we could to keep it fairly factual but also neutral. Um, if there's any issues with the information presented in this video, feel free to contact me at thisismisterreality at gmail.com and we can discuss your concerns further. Now I just wanted to give a quick shout out to everyone who joined me on the live stream uh, yesterday actually or early this morning. Uh, really awesome to have all you guys there. It was my first ever live stream as you guys know. Um, so many of my good friends showed up. Um, so many of my mentors and, um, and people I look up to were there as well. Uh, so yeah, it was fucking awesome to have you guys there and um, I think um, 
who do we have? We had four warnings, I guess, was the first person there. And if anyone knows four warnings, um, you know, she moderates for other people as well as she's a horror narrator. Um, so it was only fitting to have um, four warnings also be, you know, in tradition of the, I guess, the murder of crows or the spooky fam or whatever, uh, I guess it is, uh, to have her also a moderator on the uh, on the channel. So, um, yeah, uh, pity she couldn't stay the whole time because she had to go to work, but um, love to having her help and um, and to help out with that. So, look, guys, thank you so much for making it possible. Thank you so much for all your support and all the new subs. Thank you so much. Um, I'll see you all in the next one.